gathered here this morning. We had a great time in the presence of the Lord and we had a real sense of the Lord's presence with us this morning and we just, we just glory in him. And the children making their way out this morning, it's just like something like that, only just keep going out all the wee ones. Maybe a lot of the wee ones aren't here really tonight. It's the youth that are going out tonight. So uh, you can just see how even so many seats went empty when they all stood up and walked out. I thought everybody was going out at one time there. But uh, it's just fantastic to see. And they're going out there for a meeting. They're not going out there to sit and drink a cup of tea or coffee or drink some, a, a can of Coke and a bag of crisps and sit and uh, have a time of, of fun and uh, just mess about. They're going out there for the word of God. They're going out there to hear God's word. Will you turn with me to the scriptures, please? And will you turn with me to the book of Acts? The book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, please. Acts chapter 3, please. Bless the Lord. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, at the gate which is called beautiful, pardon me, the temple which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And they gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something off them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Let us pray. Father, Father, take your word tonight and speak to our hearts and into our lives. We pray, O oh God, that if there's one here tonight yet not saved. They would come to saving faith in your son, the Lord Jesus. Bless the youth as they have their own meeting now down there in the polytunnel, Lord. Bless the speaker and bless the leaders. We ask you, God, that you would anoint their lips, Lord, to be able to know what to say to young people in this day and hour. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them. But in this place, Lord, we ask you, may thine anointing be new again and fresh. May thine anointing come in and touch a man with clay lips and speak to our hearts, we ask it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Tonight we're looking at numbers, signs, and judgment. Numbers, signs, and judgment. Verse 1 of our reading, Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together, notice, into the temple. That's important where they went. Into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Being the ninth hour. Notice the number nine. We'll look at it a little more in a few moments. The number nine. Why go on the ninth hour? What were they doing on the ninth hour? And after the ninth hour of prayer, what happened? What was the message given? So what happened after the ninth hour? 
When we think of numbers, we think of the number one. Number one is the Shema. In other words, Deuteronomy chapter 6, when the Lord says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. So one is the number of God, one God. And one being the number of God, it also is the number of oneness of heart to love the Lord with all you are, with all you have. And that is the commandment, the greatest commandment of all when Jesus was asked to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And what Jesus was doing was taking the 10 moral commandments and placing them into two commandments. So one is the number of God, the great Shema. Two and three are the number of witness. But two speaks of a unity. Two speaks of a union. And of course, then three speaks when two people come to witness, they are in agreement and unity and union. But when three come, it strengthens the unity, the unit, the unit and the witness. For example, throughout the scriptures, we have God, the one God, and he's revealed to us in various ways, but he's revealed to us as the Father. He's revealed through the scriptures as the Son. And he's revealed as the Holy Spirit. And notice there are three, and these three are one, John tells us. Notice this, there are, is the length and the breadth of something. The length and the breadth, it gives form. Like this table before me, it has length and it has breadth, and that is the witness of a table. You know it's here, but the depth of it or the height of it is the third dimension to it, and hence three gives us more of a solidity to the number two. It backs it up and it shows us more. And hence we see the, in the word of God, God who is one yet as Father, then as Son and as Holy Spirit. Number four is the number of creation for there are four points in the compass, north, south, east and west. And there are four seasons. And of course, we know that throughout the year, spring, summer, winter and autumn, so we know the number four is, that is related to that which has been created by God. The number five is the number of grace. Five being the number of grace. Six being the number of man. And hence then seven being God's perfect and divine number. God's perfect number is the number seven. Number eight speaks of eternal things, perpetual things. So the number eight keeps going around without coming off it, stopping or starting on it. And of course, it speaks of God's character, how he is eternal. He's not only gracious, he not only becomes man as number, as number five, man is number six. Number seven, it shows us that he is perfect in every way. He is, Christ is perfect in everything, everything he does. His sacrifice was a perfect sacrifice, a once and for all perfected sacrifice. It was a finished work in its fullness. Seven means perfection. Eight speaks of his eternality. And of course, then nine. Nine we'll look at a little more because nine is the number we're looking at in Acts chapter three. Number 10 speaks of God's divine perfect order. For example, we have 10 commandments and hence we have the commandments of God's perfect order. And we could go on and on. Number 11 is a number of rebellion. Number 11 is a number of rebellion. And if we get to it tonight, I'll show you. It's a number of rebellion against God. Number 12 is God's divine and perfect order of government. The 12 uh, tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, and so on, and so on. Number 13 it's not an unlucky number, but it is a number added to God's government, which then tries to take God's glory from him. And we could go on and we could go on. But we're told by the Holy Spirit that Peter and John went up together. There's a witness, two of men, a witness. Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Do you know the number nine is used 49 times in your Bible? And it symbolizes, you ready? It symbolizes finality of signs 
going to look at it. Finality, especially of signs. And then after that comes judgment for good or judgment for the bad throughout the scriptures. For example, if we were to take the plagues of Egypt, we know there are 10 in total. And the 10th one, of course, being the slaying of the firstborn in Egypt. But the 10th one, because it's number 10, it was God's perfect order before bringing out Israel from Egypt through the blood of the Lamb. The signs were done. The judgment had come. And of course, to some it was a judgment on the evil, and to others it was a judgment for the good, bringing Israel out through the blood of the Lamb. A typifying and a picture of Christ on the cross. Let me run through the plagues of Egypt just briefly tonight. And I want you to see how this speaks the whole way through the Scriptures. First of all, it was the water turned to blood. And we haven't time to read all of this, but it's in Exodus chapter 7, you'll read this. And the water, the river Nile, was turned into blood. And every, every, one, of these, uh, every one of these plagues were actually God showing his sovereignty over the gods of the heathen. Showing his sovereignty over the gods of Egypt. And so God was showing them that he was still on the throne. And brothers and sisters, the gods of Egypt today, the world that is, the gods that we hear about and they think they're gods and they think they're running the world and they think they're going to rule the nations and they think they're building a new world order and a, and a, and a kingdom of their own. God is still on the throne and God still rules the nations. Notice here, first of all, we're going to look at nine signs of the plagues and then the tenth, the judgment. For example, the water, as I said, the Nile is turned into blood. Do you know this was against Apis, the goddess of water? The goddess who they thought supplied them with the river Nile. And so God turns the water red into blood. And the second sign was a plague of frogs. It was, from, it was against Hechat, the goddess of fertility. The goddess of fertility. And of course, we know there were frogs everywhere. It's in Exodus 7 as well. Now, it wasn't just a few frogs. I don't know what it's like to be everywhere you would be. You'd wake up in the morning and you'd have a, a frog beside you in bed. Frogs on top of your duvet. You'd have frogs in your, in your wardrobe and frogs in your suit. And you'd have to have frogs at the window and there'd be frogs everywhere. <laughs> there here a frog, there a frog, everywhere a frog, frog. And it was just frogs. And the idea of this was it was the plague showing the fertility. It was the actual frog was, a, well, well, of Hachet was a, a goddess frog. And they worshipped this god of fertility because uh, they thought that this was a, 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 the way that their, their kingdom would be developed. And they thought this is the way their kingdom would grow. And they thought this is how they would take over other nations and nationalities and be the main thrust of kingdomship in the world. And so God then says, you want frogs? I'll give you frogs. And so they, everywhere they went, there was frogs. You'd be walking down the street. You couldn't see the ground without frogs. When also and I were in Romania, and at night, especially where we lived in a little village, at night, sometimes you'd drive in uh, 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 into the, the, the grounds of the, the home where we lived. We lived with the children in the, in, the, in the orphanage home. And sometimes at night, it was that dark and you'd drive in. And if you had the window down the odd night, all you heard was, and you were driving over frogs. They were everywhere. They were just squishing. You got out in the morning, and there were splatters all over. You couldn't see them. They were everywhere. You couldn't miss them. But I don't know what it would be like in the time when they were, the, the place was just coming down with frogs. Outside, inside, everywhere they went, it was frogs everywhere. And God says, you want to worship another God? I'll let you go and worship another God. And you see, thing, friend, you see, God will let you worship. If you want to go and worship someone else other than him, rather than the Shema, the one God, who to worship him with, and love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then God will allow you to do that, friend. But you be aware that sometime you may just do it and to your own peril, you may find that it, it's no good for you. You might find that, that you are worshiping not only a false idolatrous system, even in the world, 
You might find that you're there, you're worshiping it, and it just might be that you get sick to the back teeth of it and you can do nothing about it. Such was Pharaoh in Egypt. There were frogs everywhere. Would you turn with me briefly to Exodus 16? Or pardon me, Revelation 16, sorry. Revelation chapter 16. And will you let your eye run down to verse 12, please? And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Take note. Three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. There we have the communist system we're living in today. There we have the, the politically correct, liberalized, effeminate system that we have in our society today. There we have the, the Marxist ideology that we have in our nation today. It is a system from another so-called God. Now, there only is one God, but their God. And their God is not our God. Their God is the devil. And here we see it is like spirits, unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon. There you have it, the communist system today. And out of the mouth of the beast. And there you have the New World Order government with its three-pronged attack on uh, the people of God and of the people of the world, looking for a New World Order and a One World Government. There we have Romanism heading up the, uh, the, uh, the worship system now. There's, a big, there, there's actually a, a new big place built in, I think it's in Dubai, if my memory serves me right, and it's for the, what they call the Abrahamic faiths, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And they had a meeting last week, and they all got together, and it was a unified meeting that they all believed they worshipped the same God. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. We do not worship the same God. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob is not Allah. We worship Jehovah, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And hence we see the, the dragon, then the beast, the beast. And of course, the second prong would be, it's ecclesiastical, it's governmental, and then of course, it's financial through the banking system. Notice here again, when we look at verse 13, these are like frogs and out of the mouth of a false prophet. There's, there's good old Muhammad for you there. Out of the mouth of the false prophet. Notice what it says in verse 14, for they are the spirits of devils. Take note. They are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So here we have the frogs in Egypt and now we're looking as God releases his people through the 10th plague or pardon me, after the 10th plague through the blood of the Lamb. Here we're finding now in the book of Revelation, here he's releasing again and he will release us who are saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Here's something we must take note of as well. Here, these frogs, they are numerous. Revelation says they are unclean spirits and they are spirits of devils. And what are they doing? Why are they here? Why is God allowing it? Here's something to take note. While the frogs were in Egypt and while all these other plagues started to come, when the darkness finally comes, there's still light in Goshen where Israel was. And God kept his people through the tribulation. And take note of here throughout this generation and the generations before us, right the whole way back until the Lord Jesus Christ dying for us at Calvary's tree. Right through there, he says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What has he done? He has kept the remnant of his people 
in order to bring his word to the masses who are lost. God is still working on your behalf tonight. God is still on the throne. Let's go on to the next one in, in the plagues, please. And so we have, the third one was the lice. You'll find it in Exodus chapter 8. It was the lice, and, or the nuts, as someone has called it. G-N-A-T-S. And it's the God of the desert. Now take note of this. The God of the desert. Will you turn with me to Matthew's gospel, please? Chapter 23. Matthew's gospel, chapter 23. The Lord Jesus has warned us of these uh, in Matthew 23. Warned us of these frogs that we're speaking of tonight. Matthew 23. You'll have to excuse me because I had my message written in this afternoon. I decided just to change it. So what I'm bringing you have just a couple of bullet points and we're trying to just, I thought it was just needed to uh, go a different direction tonight. Matthew 23 and verse 24, please. The Lord Jesus said to the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, he says, ye blind guides which strain not a nut and swallow a camel. Christ was speaking of the same thing, harking back, harkening back to the days of Exodus. That which was uh, of one of the gods of the desert, that which brought these swarms along and your father showed you, you want this? You want to worship this system? You want to be in this world? You want to follow all the rules and the regulations that they're bringing upon you? You want to be led by this and not by my Holy Spirit and my word? Then I'll let you be led by it. And Jesus says, you Pharisees, religious leaders, he says, you, he says, you, blind, ye blind guides which strain at a knot. The idea here was when they used to get the, the, the wine and they used to strain it through a strainer a few times in case a little tiny fly dropped into the wine. And that's it. The straining is not they're straining in the throat where they've swallowed a fly. They were straining the wine just in case, he says, you're so religious and pretentious. You cannot see the rescue and the redemption and the salvation in the Christ who is presented to you and set before you. And some people can't just see that their salvation is being offered right before them, even this very night as you sit in this tent. That Christ is the Savior, and men and women would go out the same way that they come in, lost as they come in, and lost and undone as they go out. Will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 24 while we're here, please? Take note of what the Lord Jesus said. <clears throat> Verse 24, Matthew 24 and 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, which shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now notice, behold, I have told you before. He's bringing this a second time to them. He's warning them again. I've warned you before. I'm warning you again. And he says in verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Notice, behold, he is in the desert. This was the God set, the Egyptian God of the desert in Exodus when these nuts were there. And Jesus speaking to the same people then to his disciples who were believing on him, if they tell you the false prophets, the false Christ, the false religious leaders, even if they come and tell you to go out into the desert. Don't you go. Do you know who he was warning them off? Muhammad. Muhammad's visions and revelations came in 622 AD. And those false visions and revelations came to him in the desert. It was known as the religion of the desert. Islam was known as the religion and the people of the desert. Jesus said, if they say, go out to the desert and follow this one, don't you go out. Don't you go out. And then he says, and behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. Do you know where a new pope 
when, when a pope dies, you know where a new pope, he has taken, uh, uh, the cardinals all get together, and they all go into a room, they go into a secret chamber. Did you know that? And they all lock in the secret chamber together. And when they lock in the secret chamber, they could be ours, or they could be there for days upon days. And no one knows what's going on or what's happening, but they're having to elect a new pope. And do you know how they know there's a new pope? The smoke goes up. Jesus says, don't follow the system. Do you know what's happening in the world today? And especially even in Britain, but I'm talking about even so-called evangelical Ulster, Northern Ireland. They're all starting to follow the one world system of ecumenicalism. Islam is there. Judaism is there. They're all, they're all anti-Christ religion. Rome's there. The Coptics are there. You know, we could go on and on. They're all there. And they're all gathering together that they may, as it were, worship whom they say is the same God. They are not worshiping the same God. They're worshiping the spirits of devils. And hence we see the Lord Jesus has warned us. Uh, we must go quickly, forcefully, the flies. There were flies in the fourth plague, Exodus chapter 8. I'm told these flies were, flies were more like flying bugs rather than just a little fly. And we'll just keep going on. The fifth one was the pestilence on their livestock, Exodus chapter 9. And then the sixth one was boils that would fester. Boils which would fester. Now, if you will, will you turn with me to the book of Isaiah? The book of Isaiah, please. And just turn over to the very first chapter. Festering boils. And the Lord says, if you follow me, if you love me, if you trust me, I will keep you from these plagues. Now, take note of this. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3, just for time's sake, please. Let's go to verse 2. O hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. Speaking of Israel here. They have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Notice what he says. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord, and they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. I can't see any difference here than who we are today. I can't see any difference when I look at our land and our people and our nation, when I look at the United States and Canada, when I look at Ireland, north, south, I look at the British Islands, north, south, east, and west. I just see them, how they're running after this ecumenism. They're running after the soft, soaping gospel, the back padding and, and the prosperity of it. And God looks upon not only the church, but the people, the nation. The land of saints and scholars, Ireland was. Isn't that right? The United Kingdom was the, the people of the Bible, the people who printed it and sent forth missionaries. Also was known as the, uh, the, the evangelical hotspot in the whole of Europe. And now we have turned away from the Lord to the point where the Lord would say unto us, just as he says here, that ye are a sinful people, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, and they have forsaken the Lord. We have forgot the Lord who was good to us. But rather instead, we're running after, and we're bowing down, and we're being more lamentable and applicable to the things of this world. Notice this. Verse 5, why should you be stricken any more when you revolt more and more? Notice the whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds, bruises, putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. See the state of our cities now, the no-go areas. See the state of our cities where last week there were, there were uh, running rats two weeks ago between Muslims and Hindus. 
people of another God. There's putrefying sores. They have not been closed up, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. He says, look at your land. Look at your cities. Strangers have devoured it in your presence and is desolate and is overthrown by strangers. And hence, when we look at this, we can see where have we went wrong? We have the sore boils of the plagues of Egypt when God said, if you follow me, if you love me, if you Keep my law as from government level. But the church itself, if you love me, if you stay true to my word and preach the gospel and not go to the desert nor to the closet, he says, then I will bless your land. But as God looks at us tonight, he sees wounds and bruises, putrefying sores, which have never been bound, bound up nor mollified with ointment. He only looks, he sees Boils, the actual boils in Egypt, that actually means festering, festering, festering boils. Boils that would bust with pus and blood all over the people. It was a, it was a, they were a mess. The people couldn't hardly touch anything. You think of it covered in boils and everybody's got them all over the place. They've got them from the soles of the foot to the crown of their head. They've even got them in their groin and everywhere else. So we're even talking about the boils of monkeypox recently, aren't we? God is showing us that he's still God. God is allowing us to go to worship other gods. That is those who want to do that. But he's shown that he is still God. The seventh plague is the heal from the sky god Nut and Osiris, the crop fertility god, when he says, I will rain hailstones or great stones. Revelation again, please. Chapter 21. Pardon me, it's not. It's back to 16. My head's away tonight. Sorry. 16, please. Notice this. Revelation 16, verse 17, and the seventh angel. I believe this is about where we are coming to in the time we are living in, in the day and hour that we are at. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. See the term, it is done. The words, it is done, is the exact same finishing term in its completeness and fullness as Jesus cried, it is finished on Calvary. When Christ cried, it is finished, and he bowed his head and died. Our sins were paid in full, isn't that right? In this totality, they were paid. It was done. And this is the last vial, the seventh vial. What is the number seven? Perfection of God. This is the perfection. Where are we now about number six? With all of these spirits like frogs, number six is the number of man. Man has fallen. Man is the prey of humanity. And you and I with the sin of Adam in us. And now I, the Lord, he says, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. Notice this is Babylon. Take note of this. The city is divided into three parts. And then in chapter 17 into chapter 18, you can see the three parts that I mentioned, ecclesiastical and financial are there and governmental. But notice this. The cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God. They give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Take note. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. The hailstones in Egypt, and the Lord says, if you want to run after them, I'll give you their heal then. Every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail. Notice the plague of hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. And of course, this is Babylon, the mother of heart. It's starting to fall. Babylon the great has fallen is fallen. This is where we are. We're at a place where we must continue to be faithful before God, brothers and sisters, where we must be evangelizing, reaching people, winning souls for Christ, because I believe we're seeing the, the run-in to the coming of the Lord. 
All of the things are right in front of us. We don't know the day, we don't know the hour, nor the year, but we know that it must not be too far away. Here's something I want you to take note of these numbers and signs and judgment upon Egypt. We have the heel being number seven. The plague of locusts is number eight, and that's in Exodus chapter 10. Will you turn with me to Revelation chapter 9? Revelation chapter 9. We are off the historist interpretation of prophecy here, the reformed historist interpretation of prophecy. And here we believe that this was the rise of Islam. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven. Who's that? Satan fell from heaven, kicked out of heaven. Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, didn't he? And this is him, fall from heaven into the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as a smoke of a great furnace and the sun and, and the air were darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts. Here's the eighth plague in Egypt, the locusts. It came locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power and the scorpions to have power over the earth. Let your eye run right down. We haven't time. Time's flying on us. Let your eye, it describes them. People think there's going to be a big locust coming out maybe sometime in the future with a big tail and he's going to start firing things out of his tail. There's going to be horses' heads and locusts at the back and all. That's a lot of nonsense, isn't it? Tripe and stuff. This is already explaining to us what has happened and it is regenerating again. Notice here in verse, let's let your eye run down to verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. So here we have the destroyer, the smoke coming up. The smoke were the revelations of the revelation of, of, of uh, the desert. This is the beginning of Islam, 622 AD, and Muhammad's flight from, uh, from Mecca to Medina. And he sees these in the desert. In fact, he said that, it's, it's, it's said that whenever he was in the desert, he was actually high on herbs. And the devil here, they're saying it was Allah which came and showed him these wonderful revelations. Here, it's telling us, as Jesus reminded us and warned us, not to go out into the desert after this. And it says here in the Hebrew tongue, he's called Abaddon and Apollyon. Do you know what it means? The destroyer. The one who fell from heaven. And so we see the locusts of, of Egypt. Now we have the locusts in the world today. Now the nine plagues are the nine signs. The number nine. The nine signs. Remember, nine symbolizes the finality. The finality of signs. So the nine signs of Egypt, the nine plagues. But there's one more, isn't there? The darkness comes and the death destroyer comes. That's number 10. It's God's perfect order. God's perfect order. Take note on this. If you will turn with me to Matthew 27, please. The Bible will interpret the Bible if you just follow it. There's no commentator can interpret the Bible like the Bible interprets itself. Matthew 27. Just let your eye run down, please. To verse 45. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, Six is a number of man. The sixth hour in Jerusalem would be 12 o'clock lunchtime, our time. The sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until what hour? The ninth. 
three o'clock in the afternoon. From 12 to three, there was darkness. Now, this doesn't mean it's as though the sun just went down and it got a bit dark. This means it was a blackness, a darkness that could be felt. It meant that it was a blackness, a darkness that you couldn't even see a finger in front of you. And on the night when Israel were told to take the blood of a lamb and put it in a basin and get the hyssop and dip it into the basin and put it upon the doorposts and put it on the door lintels. And the Lord says tonight, and listen to what he says about midnight. He says, I'm coming through. This is in judgment. I'm coming through Egypt tonight. But when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. And hence we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ on the ninth hour cried with a loud voice. Let's read it. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Lama, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The ninth, the ninth hour, all the hours were done in the day. Right to the ninth. And now the blood has been shed. And the darkness came on him. Just the way it came on the Egyptians. It came on him. The way it should have been on you. And it should have been on me because of our sin. And he took our sin. And he took our darkness. And he took our place. And he's our substitute. And he shed his blood. Just like the blood of the lamb. Why? That you and I can go free. Can you see it in the scriptures, brothers and sisters? Take note here. The death of the firstborn in Egypt was the judgment of Egypt. And at midnight. Now take note of this. The Lord says in the book of Exodus, and we haven't time to turn, Exodus chapter 12, in verse 29, he says, it says, and at midnight the Lord came and judged. I'm paraphrasing, at midnight, number 12, God's government, he had governed this to happen. You know the parable of the, the 10 virgins? There's a number 10 by 10. Ten tribes of Israel in the north were away. Some says that, but it's God's perfect number. That's where the gospel would come through. Ten commandments and so on. God's perfect number of divine order. And here the Lord Jesus is saying about five were wise, five were foolish, five were receiving grace and five didn't. Five were ready and five were unprepared it was. Ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. And take note of this. It says on about midnight. About midnight, there was a great cry made. Do you know what it says about Egypt at midnight? It says at midnight when God was coming through. And there was a great cry throughout Egypt. God had come in judgment. The great cry went out through Egypt. But all who were under the blood, there was no crying in their household. And it says in the parable of the, the ten virgins in Matthew 25, and about midnight there was a great cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Go ye out to meet him! And only five were ready. And they enter in to the marriage chamber, but when they get to the marriage chamber, what happens? The five foolish come. Lord, open to us. Lord, open to us. Lord, open to us. He says, depart from me, I don't know you. Are you ready? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you saved? Then ask you to go to church. These Pharisees, he said to them, you'll swallow a gnat. You, 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 you're, you're straining at a gnat and you'd swallow a camel. You, he even says you'll keep others from going to heaven because of your religion and religion will take you to hell. It's Christ who takes you to heaven. Lord, open to us, he says, depart from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. 
Ah, oh, but Jesus knows everybody's God, does he not? Oh, absolutely. It means in an intimate fashion, in an intimate way, as a husband has special union with his wife. In other words, Jesus says, you've loved me or you haven't loved me. Have you loved me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength? Are you under my grace? Did you come through the blood that I shed at Calvary? Are you, have you received, are you accepting of what I have done for you? We have walked together. We have talked together. We have fellowship together. When you get up in the morning, you thought about me. And I spoke with you and you spoke with me and you read, you read the word and we, we, we feasted together. We supped with each other for you heard my voice and you opened the door. And in spirit, we were communing all of the day. Every day, not just a Sunday, every day. And it's those who are ready. The oil is in their vessels and the oil is in their lamps. And I fear there's someone and your oil's gone out. It's run out and there's no light. And on the day and the hour that I'm talking about, I've shown you where we are in the world, where we are in society, where we are. Do you know the number 12 or midnight if you want? Do you know the doomsday clock? And it's not a Christian thing. It's not a religious thing. The doomsday clock is set by scientists of the world. Do you know the doomsday clock? Do you know where it is today as we sit here? Because I checked it before I came out. I don't have it on the wall, by the way. I had to look it up. Do you know where we are? One hundred seconds from midnight. Do you know what they do? They take all the things that are happening in the world, the devastation, and all the things that are happening. They take the even the the the, the global things that are happening, the wars. They think of, of Russia and, and NATO and they look at it with Ukraine and, and they think of China and the threats of war with the Amer United States of America. And they look at all of these things. They look at famines and they look at earthquakes and they look at volcano eruptions and diseases and murders and, and the cities as we talked about being overrun and, and, and no-go areas. They look at it all and they say, surely the world can't go on much more. And do you know what hasn't changed in the last three years because they've kept it on red alert. 100 seconds, they say, from midnight. And behold, a great cry. It was at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And while the world is chasing the religion of the desert, the gods of Egypt, and those in the closet, and while the, the, the spirits like devils, these unclean spirits like frogs, and while they're alive and, and multiplying, and, and it seems like we're under pressure at times as the church, while all of this is happening, Christ has warned us to keep oil in your vessels and your lamp because he says, I'm going to come soon. He's coming. Are you saved? Are you ready? Here's something for you to think about. While we're just on this number nine, I'll wrap this up because that's plenty for you for tonight. I don't think you've expected that. To be honest, I didn't expect to preach that tonight. I came with something else. But there we are. Listen to this. The Lord in the last three signs to Egypt, do you know what he says? And it's from Exodus 9, from 13 to verse 35. But in verse 14, this is what he says to them. He says that more or less what he's saying is the next few plagues are going to get worse. Something happening in Egypt that they'd never seen before. Greater than the other plagues that's happened in the past. I wonder what's happened in the last couple of years. Is that one of them for us? In the Egypt of this world and the time that we're in. Notice here, the Lord says, and why would the Lord allow this? And why would the Lord do this? He says, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in the earth. What is it going to take? What is it going to take before the government of our nation? What is it going to take before the church? And I'm talking about universally here. 
What is it going to take to waken them up to the days and the hour in which we live? What is it going to take to waken up the people? What is it going to take to waken us up to realize it? For the Lord says these will get worse before the midnight hour comes here. Peter and John go to pray at the ninth hour. Notice the ninth hour. So nine symbolizes finality and judgment. I'm going to wrap this up if you give me a few moments. Here's something about the number nine. Not only did Christ cry and give up the ghost. He died. Judgment came on him that we might be saved. But the total destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, you ready? Was on the ninth day of Av, of the calendar month of Av. On the ninth day. Now, when the house of Judah were taken into captivity, in fact, when, when you go to, through the scriptures and you were to go to uh, 2 Kings 17, it tells us, the northern kingdom of Israel, and we had the southern kingdom of Judah. And the northern kingdom of Israel, um, uh, pardon me, the southern kingdom of Israel, of Judah, uh, there's a man called Hosea began to reign in the north, pardon me, in the north. And on the, he was the last king who reigned in the north. And his year that he was, he was judged the nation was judged and it was taken away into captivity by Assyria was in the ninth year of Hosea. The number nine, God's finality. And God sent the enemy in to take them away, never returned there again. And then in 2 Kings 25, we have the reign of the king of Judah. And his name was Zedekiah. I'm sure we all heard him before that know the scriptures. And, and Zedekiah, his year was the ninth year too. And God had warned again, wouldn't listen, and took the house of Judah away into Babylon. Now, while in Babylon, you'll read of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, Ezekiel. Uh, you'll read of, of, of Esther there as well, and so on. But what they did was they took the Babylonian, they're in Babylon. They took the Babylonian teachings, and they started to mix them with their religion. And then later on in years when the Lord Jesus comes, they have what's known as the Babylonian Talmud teaching among the rabbis. And hence Jesus says, you're off your father, the devil, to them. John the Baptist calls him a brood of vipers. It's because of this teaching. Now this is important. Listen. After the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the ninth day of Av, A.D. 70, the second temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. The second temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. In 586 B.C., on the ninth day of Av, the month Av, the first temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. The same day, the same date, the same month. Now, if you look up, say, a Jewish calendar today, they'll tell you the month of Av is the fifth month of their calendar. But going by the Babylonian Talmud, do you know when the month of Av is? It's called the civil dates of the calendar. Do you know when the month of Av is? The 11th month. The ninth day of the 11th month. 9-11. Sound familiar? The World Trade Center, one world government, new world order starting, 9-11. And the exact day, and God brought down that house, that temple, the first temple and the second temple, showing that he's still God over the Babylonian system. All in the same day. Same date, same month. Well, I'm going to stop, but let me finish with this because listen to what Peter says. If you'll go to Acts chapter 3 again. Acts chapter 3. This is what Peter says after going to the temple in the ninth hour. The man is, 
that's lame and his feet he is healed. Listen to what Peter says. This was the outcome of it. The people were gathering around. What is happening? Acts 3 and verse 13. He says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. He's speaking to the Jews here. You done this, he said. You delivered him up. You denied him in Pilate's, in front of Pilate. When he, Pilate, was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof ye are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name that made this man strong whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot not that what through ignorance as ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore. Repent ye. Therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What do you need to do tonight if you don't know him? What do you need to do tonight if you've wandered from him? What do you need to do tonight if you've sinned before him? What do you need to do tonight if you know in your heart you haven't been right with him? What do you need to do tonight? What does the world need to do? What does our families and our friends, what do the children in the, down here being taught, in, or pardon me, the teenagers in their, their own meeting tonight, they need to repent and be converted and be converted that their sins might be blotted out. The ninth hour, they go to pray. Why? Christ had paid the debt. He's buried and resurrected. Why still go to the temple? Because the Lord gave them about 40 years. And 40 is the number of testing and trial. And while they went to the temple to pray, they were showing the power of Christ. They were showing the power. They didn't join in in ecumenical service with them because Christ had damned Judaism. Christ had made it of none effect. They didn't join in. They went and they preached Christ to them. And on the 9th of Av, AD 70, they didn't listen. And Titus came from Rome, besieged the city. And Jesus warned to the disciples, when you see the city encompassed around with armies, listen to the believers, he said, if you see the city encompassed around with armies, he says, flee to the mountains. Don't go back to get your coat. People said that's the second coming. How could it be? Sure, what would it matter if you took your coat or not? So when Titus came, he says, flee. And everyone who listened to Christ and his words, they would flee to the mountains and they were safe. Will you flee from, will you flee from, will you flee from all the things of the world and, and from the judgment that looms over? And we know not when the bridegroom cometh. Did we not sing it? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Pure and white in the blood of the Lamb. You can have your eyes open tonight, brothers and sisters. Now, when you see what's happening, you can see the spirits, three unclean spirits like frogs. You can think of how the Lord put this in literal form in Egypt and now through men and women and spirituality, 
of, of, the, of the spirits of devils. You can see it in the world today. Maybe you're part of that, but the Lord can save you if you come through the blood. You give your life to Christ. Tim, would you come up, please? Who remembers the wee course Peter and John went to pray? 